In October of 49 BC, Caesar returned to Rome after defeating Pompeius's legates in Hispania, and successfully concluding the siege of Massilia. Nine months had passed since Caesar had crossed the Rubicon River with his 13th legion, formally declaring civil war against Pompeius, Marcus Porcius Cato and the Boni, and all within Rome's Senate who had self-righteously abused the law in an attempt to prevent Caesar's standing for his second consulship. Along with several members of the Boni, the 49 BC consuls, Gaius Claudius Marcellus and Lucius Cornelius Lentulus Crus, had evacuated Italy on the orders of Pompeius Magnus, and fled to Greece. With no legal consuls in Rome at the time of Caesar's return, elections for the 48 BC year, which were traditionally overseen by the consuls, could not legally be held. Caesar, attempting to finally secure his second consulship, offered a solution in the absence of the consuls, suggesting two praetors might instead be charged with overseeing the elections. The augurs and other religious officers who were still in Rome, however, refused on the grounds that the elections, themselves, were holy, sanctioned by the gods, and could not be altered to meet the selfish greed of a single man. Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, whose eponymously named father was defeated by young Pompeius Magnus, and whose grandfather, tribune of the plebs, Lucius Apollius Saturninus, was viciously murdered by the Optimates, was a strong supporter of Caesar and the Populares party. Having won election as praetor for the 49 BC year, Lepidus moved that Gaius Julius Caesar be made dictator of the Roman Empire. Because the office of dictator was voted on by the Senate, religion was not a consideration. As dictator, Caesar's word would be law, even according to the religious dictates of the priests and augurs. Because most of the senators who would oppose such a motion had fled to Greece with Pompeius, Caesar easily met the necessary quorum from among the smattering of senators who had remained in Rome, and was elected dictator. As dictator, Caesar immediately held elections for the 48 BC year, winning for himself his second consulship. Serving as his co-consul was Publius Servilius Vatia Asauricus, husband of Junia Prima, the eldest daughter of Caesar's mistress, Servilia. Caesar also used the office of dictator to appoint, rather than elect, several other officials to various offices, including the office of Praetor Urbanus. This office, which granted imperium to its holder, arbitrated disputes between Roman citizens. Because Rome needed to have one senior magistrate with imperium in the city at all times, the Praetor Urbanus could not leave the city limits, thereby allowing both consuls to leave the city during times of national crisis. To the office of Praetor Urbanus, with the task of administering his new debt laws, Caesar appointed his loyal legate, Gaius Trebonius. Trebonius had been appointed a legate by Caesar in 54 BC, and had journeyed with Caesar to Britannia, where he had been given command of three legions and had helped secure Caesar's defeat of Cassivellaunus. After returning to Gaul, Trebonius aided Caesar in the rescue of Quintus Cicero, who was nearly defeated at the hands of Ambiorix. In Elysia, Trebonius, alongside Marcus Antonius, had successfully repelled the nighttime attack led by Vercingetorix's cousin, Vercassivellornos. At the end of 50 BC, when Caesar received word that then consul, Gaius Claudius Marcellus, had asked Pompeius Magnus to take up arms and protect Rome from Caesar, Gaius Trebonius had moved his troops into Adui territory, where he'd waited until Caesar ordered him to march to the town of Massilia, where Trebonius concluded a successful siege. Unfortunately, Gaius Trebonius was not the only person interested in the office of Praetor Urbanus. Marcus Caelius Rufus, who had served apprenticeships, first under Marcus Tullius Cicero, then under Marcus Licinius Crassus, also coveted the position. Leveraging his ongoing friendship with Cicero, who had even defended Caelius in court when Caelius's lover, Clodia, a sister of Publius Clodius, had accused him of attempted poisoning, Caelius sought to keep the orator neutral, urging him not to make an enemy of Caesar. For rendering this service to Caesar, Caelius had his eye on the office of Urban Praetor, where he meant to use the position to orchestrate the cancellation of his own personal debts, which were astounding. By rubbing elbows with the crowd of younger politicians such as Gaius Scribonius Curio and Publius Cornelius Dolabella, both of whom were members of Caesar's inner circle, Caelius had amassed enormous debts 
but unlike Dolabella, who went to Hispania with Caesar and Curio, to whom Caesar had given command of his campaign in Africa, Caelius had been given no commands with which he might earn his fortune. Instead, the office Caesar gave to Caelius was that of Praetor Peregrinus. This office, which came without the protection of Imperium, oversaw disputes between Roman citizens and non-Roman citizens, and since the lenders who held Rome's politicians within the folds of their togas were all citizens, Caelius's new office was of no use in pursuing his financial freedom. To make matters even worse, Caesar's new debt laws, administered by Trebonius, robbed Caelius of the opportunity to outright cancel his own debts, as Caesar's laws only granted extensions to those in debt, and regulated less stringent fees for late payments. As a protest, Caelius, in his capacity as Praetor Peregrinus, set up his tribunal within earshot of Gaius Trebonius's tribunal as Praetor Urbanus. Day after day, Caelius called out to those who appealed to Trebonius, promising that if they felt cheated by the Praetor Urbanus, he would listen to their cases with a more favourable disposition. But day after day, no applicant took Caelius up on his offer. What use was a Praetor Peregrinus within the jurisdiction of the Praetor Urbanus? Frustrated at not having pulled any supporters from Trebonius, Marcus Caelius Rufus began agitating for a law which would grant people one year's free rent, and another law for a general cancellation of debt. As Rome had learned during the conspiracy of Catalina, a call for general debt cancellation was a signal for revolution. Those who stood to benefit from debt cancellation and a year's free rent, suddenly began to rally around Caelius, until his group grew large enough to become a threat to Gaius Trebonius. At this point, Caesar's co-consul, Vatia Asauricus, accompanied by his twelve lictors, marched into the Forum Romanum to confront Caelius. Caelius and Asauricus nearly came to blows, but Asauricus, as consul, held imperium, making it illegal and punishable by death for Caelius to lay hands on him. Despite the growing crowd, Asauricus removed an axe from one of his lictors' fasces and used it to destroy Caelius's chair. When the throng surrounding Caelius grew threatening, all of Asauricus's lictors withdrew their axes from among the rod bundles stuffed into their fasces, and the crowd reluctantly dispersed. In an attempt to mock Trebonius, Caelius simply mended his broken chair with leather straps, and returned to his tribunal the next day. According to rumour, Trebonius, as a child, had been beaten by his father with leather straps. But the taunt did not affect Trebonius, who claimed that the lessons he had learned from his father had merely toughened him. In the Senate, Asauricus brought a motion to remove Marcus Caelius Rufus from service to the state, which easily passed. When Caelius tried to attend a Senate meeting, he found he was excluded even from general participation. In response, Caelius tried to mount the rostra, and gather people to himself through flowery speeches, but Asauricus's lictors ran him out of the Forum Romanum. Angered and humiliated over such treatment, Caelius made a pretense of going to join Caesar who, eleven days after winning his consulship, and making appointments to other governmental offices, resigned as dictator, leaving Rome in the hands of Asauricus, while he made his way to Greece to face Pompeius Magnus. But Caelius had no intention of taking his case to Caesar, whose very debt laws he was fighting. Instead, Caelius wrote to Titus Annius Milo, who was still exiled in the town of Massilia for the murder of Publius Clodius. Because Milo also had a retinue of gladiators around him, Caelius enlisted his aid in a plot against Caesar. While Caesar and his forces were in Greece, Caelius and Milo could begin a rebellion in the name of Pompeius Magnus, and successfully undermine Caesar's debt laws. Milo agreed, and led his gladiators and other followers back into Italy, where he journeyed to Capua. In Capua, Milo's gladiators were to recruit from the city's abundant supply of gladiators, and eventually betray the city. As he moved towards Capua, Milo also sent dispatches around to the various towns and municipalities claiming that he was acting on the orders of Pompeius Magnus. This helped to stir up the people who supported Pompeius Magnus, but had lost hope when the general fled Italy. Unfortunately for Milo, the city of Capua closed its gates to him and his gladiators. And while his dispatches raised spirits for those anxious for Pompeius to be victorious, 
they did not produce an army, as Milo had hoped. In response, he released imprisoned slaves from various dungeons, and with his gladiator and slave army, marched for and besieged the town of Cosa, in Thurii. There, a random stone, cast from the town walls, hit Titus Annius Milo in the head, killing him instantly. Caelius, who also marched to Thurii, only to find Milo dead, did his best to bribe the Gallic and Hispanic cavalry left behind by Caesar. The cavalry, instead, took Marcus Caelius Rufus into custody and killed him. Thus ended the first outbreak of a small political movement aimed at the 48 BC consul and former dictator Gaius Julius Caesar.